All right, joining us now, we are very lucky to have one of our great friends, um, editor-in-chief of The Real News, Maximilian Alvarez, the one and only. Great to see you, my friend. Good to see you, Max. Great it has been guys. way too long like since we've been together. <laughs> we were trying yeah. to figure out, was it like back during the debate? The Democratic primary, yeah, probably the last time that we did one of those Which shows. Which feels like 40 lifetimes ago. <laughs> a million so years ago, yeah. It's beautiful <laughs> to see you in person. Um, we want to get to some of the amazing work that you've been doing on the ground in Wisconsin. And by the way, everybody go and sub to The Real News on YouTube. YouTube. We're going to put the link in the description because Max is doing phenomenal work over there, along with a great team of journalists that deserve your support. But I want to get your thoughts on this New York City uh, primary race. We finally have the results now. It took long enough. Mm. Um, but Eric Adams, who, you know, ran, he positioned himself as this like populist champion of the working class. And in fact, the black and brown working class in New York did back him largely. But I think Ross Barkin put it really well. He's been covering this in a great way, and we can throw his piece up on the screen there. Yes, he's unquestionably the mayor of the working class. He's also unquestionably the mayor of real estate, Wall Street, and capital. So, Max, I thought you'd be the perfect person to provide insight into how those two things can happen. It's quite, it's quite the, uh, the coalition, um, but I think it's, it's a really important point, um, right, that, like, how can you actually signal to both of these constituencies Right under one sort of candidate, and I mean I think that in a lot of ways um, Eric Adams, as a person, you know, as a former uh, police officer, um, as someone who you know had very much was strict and disciplined on his messaging throughout the campaign, focusing on a crime wave that the media was all too happy to bolster. Not that it's coming from nowhere, right? But it's um, you know it was something that he was able to kind of stick with through in uh, throughout the the election cycle. And I think that for the working class folks, um, there are a couple of important factors here. Uh, Adams did net quite a few big endorsements from labor unions, right? And I think that what he represents for a lot of interested parties is kind of, um, you know, a new embodiment of the old New York machine politics where people's faith in him is largely in his ability to make backroom deals, to um, pull levers of power mm. where that they normally feel they have no access to. So I imagine that a lot of labor unions felt like, um, you know, this, this is at least a guy who knows how to get things done. If we can get him to listen to us, um, we may get something out of this. But, you know, I think that um, as a lot of like rank and file and, and pro rank and file democracy movements in the labor movement have kind of signaled, you know, like as with labor's value on the shop floor, right, the strongest uh, weapon that labor has is to withhold its labor. In the same way, labor unions, like, big political influence could come from withholding endorsements. A lot of labor unions are not willing to do that um, because they're playing so far behind, so they mm. make the compromises that they do by endorsing folks like Eric Adams, hoping that, in fact, he'll, he'll kind of scratch their backs if they scratch his. Labor unions have tried this before in New York, and they've been burned by a number of different mayors, uh, both Republican and Democrat. Um, so I think that... You know, it's it's largely a sign of you know people really just uh, of the labor movement kind of doing what it, the best it can with what it's got, um, but not being willing to really wield its influence. And in a place like New York, a heavily unionized city, uh, the fact that labor unions are not willing to do that is very concerning. And then there's also the kind of issue of police. And I think that the left, especially, but all of us, kind of really need to think long and hard about what it means for black and brown and working class folks who do want more police, right, or who, who are afraid of things like the crime wave, like what that means in their daily lives. And I think that Eric Adams did tap into that. I, I can say, till I'm blue in the face, that that crime wave is in large part a media, you know, like a creation. It doesn't well, mean that people don't feel it, right? It doesn't mean that it's coming from nowhere. Murder rate is higher since 1995, okay? Like, so it's not a media creation to say it's the highest since 1995. And in terms of reporting and all of that, murder is actually one of the most reported crimes because there's literally a dead body. Mm -hmm. So I would say this is where I get a little bit frustrated. And you have been somebody who I think has always been very honest about what exactly is happening here. So how do you square the fact, like what happened with Eric Adams? And I've actually said this with Crystal. People are trying to paint too much of a brush. Larry Krasner also won in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, and she's Chase Boudin's probably going to get recalled, and, and he's India probably going to win. Just won up and in India Buffalo. Walton, who's mm -hmm. basically half defund the police, just won in Buffalo. So, like, it is not like a, you know, but that being said, 
crime is a problem, especially nationally. How do you think this is gonna square for the progressive movement when you can't even win in a place like New York City? Like Philly aside, Buffalo, great. But like, it's such a beacon in terms of the politics that it does seem to be a significant blow. It's gonna, it is a significant yeah. blow, it's gonna be. I mean, I think that anyone who says it's not is lying, yeah. right? And, and, and kidding themselves, yeah. frankly. And you know, when, I, when I say that you know, we need to kind of think um, more critically about why working class folks, especially in black and brown communities, do respond um, mm -hmm. to kind of things like media um, coverage of the crime wave and then a candidate like Eric Adams, who is able to both say that he's gonna address it but also signal because of his past that you know he would do it the right way, right? That he was a police reformer, right? That he would make sure that policing, which still a lot of working class communities do rely on, right, would be done in a more equitable and just way, right? We're largely kind of taking that on faith, but here's where I think like the really important point is. You guys know that like, you know, we've discussed this before, like I covered the Amazon Union Drive investment, mm -hmm. right? There were a lot of um, Amazon workers after that who said like, look, a union sounded great, but the fact is that Bessemer is still a deindustrialized town um, that is twice the national poverty rate. A $15 wage at Amazon is still one of the best things that we can get. Yep. And it, you really had people who were in a situation of choosing between the devil they knew and the devil they didn't, right? Most of them didn't know what it would mean to be in a union. And most of them knew very, very well what it meant to be on the knife's edge of keeping a roof over their head. I bring that comparison up because most working class people in this country have only ever known what it feels like to live under siege, mm -hmm. right? And we make decisions like from that position. <clears throat> in the abstract, the notion that more union density in this country would lead to higher wages, more workplace democracy, and would lift the floor for everyone, is still largely theoretical because we, we haven't had it in so long. Yeah. Most people don't know. Same goes for um, the police argument. I think there's, there's a lot of connective tissue here where folks living in kind of underserved um, communities where you do see a lot of crime have only ever known like p the police as a potential solution to make them safe, mm -hmm. right? Even if the police do not always make them safe, right? I mean, it's the one thing that they know that can, you know, like keep crime from impeding their abilities to live the lives that they want. They don't know what it means to live in a society where uh, a more economically just system can actually kind of improve their life yeah. quality. We're trying to make these high level, philosophical, theoretical arguments to a group of people who's, who has to live in the here and now, right? <laughs> who, because they're under siege in that way, has to live for today and tomorrow and the immediate future. Um, when I talked about India Walton, who's the first uh, socialist candidate to win a mayoral election in a major city in like since the 60s, because um, apparently they don't count Bernie Sanders, Burlington's not a major city, I guess. <laughs> it's um, a town. But the, <laughs> it is actually, it's pretty it's small. nice town. Very nice town. I like Vermont. Yeah. Um, but you know, the last, so before India Walton, the last mayor of a major city who was a socialist was in Milwaukee and was considered, they called themselves sewer socialists, mm -hmm. which was supposed to be derogatory at first because the other sort of like cool socialists were like, why are you guys talking about your awesome sewer system all the time? <laughs> but this was actually very successful because it was concrete. It was like, no, no, we are delivering real services that are important to you in the here and now. And so the philosophy of the sewer socialists was to connect really tangibly to like the needs and concerns of working class people in the here and now, and to push to the side some of the higher level rhetoric or more revolutionary rhetoric. It was really about meeting those needs. And so in this weird way, I see a connection between Eric Adams' run, which was very concrete. I'm gonna make you feel personal, physical safety in your daily lives today. And also India Walton, who was very effective at addressing concerns over gentrification and people not having access to the opportunity. And also just, you know, this guy who's been there forever and is kind of corrupt and like people are done with him. So in these mayoral races in particular, so much of it is we think in terms of ideology because that's what we think about and we all have an ideology. We care a lot about it and it means a lot to us. But a lot of this is not particularly ideo ideological. It's like, who do I actually think is gonna fight for me? Who's gonna be capable of making those deals and being able to deliver for me in the here and now? 
there's there's a place on the left for people who are doing that high level theoretical thing. That's really, really important. But I do think that Eric Adams election says something about the inability of the left to make their high level ideas concrete for people in the here and now. And we should also say, you know, that the left shot themselves in the face five different ways in this race. I and mean, Diane Morales turns out to be total fraud that like collapses. And then we're left with people like Scott Stringer and Maya Wiley, who are the left. I mean, these are people who like supported Hillary Clinton. So, you know, these are like and Elizabeth MSNBC Warren. analysts. These are like Elizabeth Warren yeah. types. So it's not like we really had a candidate we were pulling for here to start with. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, like, um, the race itself was, uh, from the jump, a sign of the left's uh, institutional powerlessness, mm, right? And that's well said. I think that um, this connects to something that I know that you guys have been talking about a lot, right? Like, when I was traveling around Wisconsin for The Real News, I remember being in Podunk, you know, like, kind of a uh, motel uh, with the uh, minimal Wi-Fi connection, but I was watching <laughs> kind of the conversations that y'all were having with and about Joe Rogan and about mm. the, the the left um, and kind of especially kind of what we call the online left's kind of proclivity for, um, I don't know, canceling or, or kind of uh, judging people in, in sort of a discourse-based way. Mm. I think this connects to kind of the, the, the question that we're talking about here, yeah. right? I mean, I don't think one of the arguments I've constantly been making to people is that it's not like there's something ideologically germane to who to the left that makes us like more willing to cancel people, right? Or to try to direct politics through things like Twitter and stuff like that. That's just the only realm that most people who have left politics feel like they have any impact on the world, mm. right? Yeah, because that's we, true, actually. That's, because it, we don't- Frankly, ha- is. It is. I mean, like, I mean, like, and not to, not to kind of short shrift, right, the advances we're making in the labor movement, you know, the important kind of um, folks who are running for local offices to try to have that real tangible impact on their communities while holding true to their leftist principles. But in comparison to the Democratic machine and Republicans, like, we're, we're exceedingly far behind, right? And so when you don't have other avenues to sort of challenge or channel the, that political energy to bear tangible results, if you do see some tangible results in people changing their opinions because a lot of people on Twitter got mad at them or someone getting fired for a bad take, if that is the one realm in which you feel some sort of power to shape the world that you live in, that's what you're going to focus on. And the left really needs to kind of inject that energy into the labor movement, into community organizing, into building the kind of broad, uh, local, um, state-by-state infrastructure yeah. that the Republicans have done exceedingly well That's at. Nice. I, I just saw a headline. I have no idea whether this is true or whatever, <laughs> but it was like, QAnon's going after the school boards. And yeah. I was like, oh, shit, if they're I, doing I'm that, that's actually... I'm literally looking at it right that's now. Actually yeah, yeah, right, yeah. That's actually bad, because that's actually a good idea. Yeah. So we should be doing more of that. Yeah. Um, Max, I do want to talk to you about your trip to Wisconsin. Um, you found this really fascinating coalition in rural Wisconsin that's trying to push back against these gigantic factory farms, hog farms in particular. Um, Talk to us a little bit about that, and I want to play a little bit of the clip that we have. For sure, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it, because this is a project that's really near and dear to my heart, and it's something that we're really excited about. You know, The Real News is teaming up with In These Times for this large investigative project called the Wisconsin Idea, which is mainly focusing on the changing political terrain in rural Wisconsin, Mm -hmm. right, which... um, everyone knows, you know, like has been largely abandoned by both parties in a lot of instances, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, you still see a lot of Trump flags when you're driving around rural Wisconsin, which we were doing, we were going all over the state. Um, but you also see, I think, real fertile ground for kind of cross ideological coalitions fighting in common cause against things that they know are bad for them and their communities. What we're focusing on this month are, you know, three rural counties in the western side of the state Uh, that are trying to fight off the construction of these massive industrial hog farms, right? Owned by Smithfield uh, Foods, own, uh, you know, joint venture with Cumberland LLC, the Roth Feeder Pig CAFO, or Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation in Crawford County. There's a lot of important politics going on in these struggles, and you're seeing uh, folks from the left, folks from the right, folks who don't really consider themselves very political in fact, kind of coming together and say, we don't want these massive, polluting, local economy destroying, local community upending uh, hog farms to be placed in our communities. And what they're finding, going back to what we were just talking about, is that through decades of state legislation, 
their ability to kind of have a say in their local communities has been stripped by mm. the state. Mm -hmm. And it's with the help of kind of big ag lobbyists and stuff like that. And you saw a very like pointed example of this in Polk County, Wisconsin, where uh, community members voted to put a moratorium on the construction of this uh, massive 26,000 head hog farm that again, they know is gonna pollute the waterways. It's gonna smell like literal crap, right? It's gonna produce a lot of, like millions upon millions of gallons of pig feces that's gonna run off into the rivers, that's gonna poison the air, it's gonna make a lot of the water undrinkable, it's gonna tank property values, it's gonna affect everybody, right? Um, you're seeing kind of this interesting coalition of people coming together and saying, we don't want this here. Um, and when they voted to put you know, a moratorium and when they voted to try to regulate in a moderate way the construction of this uh, hog farm, they were, the, the county board of supervisors was slapped with a kind of threatening letter saying that they would be charged with federal crimes Jeez. if they voted wow. yes for this, Whoa. right? And, and so you really see the two different legal systems highlighted in, in rural parts of the country where um, these, these international uh, entities, because like in the Smithfield hog yep. farm, all that meat's going to China. Of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and and it's, it's making like Polk County the toilet um, not providing like real economic mm. stimulus, yeah. and and it's um it's really sad. We have a bit of a, a a clip from your recent trip down there. Let's take a listen to that. People need to raise their voices about this. People need to recognize that there are folks all around this community who are fighting for not just like their land, their air, and their water, but I mean their community as such. Now you put this massive CAFO here that's going to destroy kind of all the kind of shared common resources that people here depend on, what's going to be left of the community, right? What's going to be left of the land? And that damage is going to stay for a long fucking time. Matt's wow. doing incredible work on the ground in Wisconsin. Yep. Um, you guys are always focused on things that no one else is paying attention to, but are really driving what's happening in politics writ large. Give them a follow over there at The Real News. Support that the, the work that they're doing um, in every way that you can. We'll have a link down in the description. Thanks, so guys. great to yeah. see you. We appreciate you. Thank Likewise. you, Max. Thanks, guys. Yeah, really appreciate it. Everybody, thank you all so much for watching uh, or listening. We really appreciate it. You guys can become a premium subscriber today. Listen to the entire show an hour early and watch it as well. Um, that's right down there in the description link. And we will see you all next Monday. Have that's a good right. weekend, everybody. Have a great weekend, guys. See you on Monday. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.